Welcome back to another episode of Season 5 of the RAG Podcast. As you guys know by now, this is the number one podcast across the recruitment sector globally. And we've always been on a mission to help recruitment agencies grow by interviewing founders and telling their stories of success from startup all the way to scale up and exit. Well, this season, we're a little bit different. How do you, as a recruitment leader and founder, maintain your family and friendships whilst being the best person at work? How do you stay physically fit mentally and emotionally? And how do you find time for yourself in the madness? How do you find time for self-interest, for hobbies and self-improvement? Well, to help you with this, I'm going to be interviewing someone every single week that can demonstrate experience in one or more of these areas. So I'm going to talk to recruitment founders and also some experts from outside the industry who can deep dive into things like relationships and health and well-being. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast. Uh, the sun is shining today. We are now beginning of April and I am back with another amazing episode for you guys. I'm literally buzzing about this session. Um, so today I'm joined by a guy who I didn't know till recently. Um, a guy called Ed Stevens. You might not even recognize the name, but Ed is the founder of a recruitment business called 94 Group um, that are five years old with 45 growing to 60 staff um, headquartered in London in tax, technology, and legal recruitment with a, a huge ambition to be a thousand people um, in the future. Um, but Ed's not doing this for the first time. He was a, an amazing um, success story at Hydrogen Group originally when, it, when they went through a flotation. Um, he then left and launched Eximius Group, which he grew um, over an eight year period in 2008 to 2016, sold um, via an MBO in 2016, um, made a life-changing amount of money, had a year out, spent time with his kids and his wife and went to the south of France and did all sorts. And then he 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 then launched 94. But the clarity this guy has on how he's building his business is probably unlike anything I've ever I've ever heard before. I've never interviewed a founder with such clarity. And I think it comes from being a at the second stage. So having had a business with with co-founders and Done, made all the mistakes. He's now a single founder with a single mission. He knows exactly how he's doing it. He's got serious structure and ability to reinvest and grow his team and and the what what they get out of the process. Um, anyone listening to this um, is going to is going to get significant value. There's no doubt you're gonna you're gonna enjoy this episode and you're gonna feel like um, you've walked away with um, a mini MBA or something. This guy is serious in his approach to understanding the growth of a recruitment business. Um, so let's get into today's episode without further ado. So Ed, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thanks for having me, Sean. You're a star. Not a, not a problem, mate. It's not a problem. Um, look, I've given you a, a brief introduction uh, that I, I can never do justice. So for the listener's benefit, anyone who doesn't know you, could you just give us yeah. an overview of who you are right now? Yeah, so uh, founder of 94 Group. Um, my background is 17 years in the recruitment sector. Um, wow. Started working for uh, what is now Hydrogen. Um, left that business after it floated. Um, founded a business called uh, Eximius Group. Uh, ran that for eight years. Did a number of interesting things with, with that business and with a couple of other brands that we built off uh, Eximius. Sold uh, all of those entities in 2016. Um, I've got uh, a wife and two young daughters, so had a bit of time out in 2016 with them, um, and then kick-started 94 in 2017. Um, and we are currently today, so we've got three brands, so 94 Tax, uh, 94 Legal, and 94 Tech. Um, they do what they say on the tin, so tax, we place tax professionals, legal, we place legal professionals. In technology, we place mainly software engineers and also mm -hmm. cybersecurity individuals. Um, and from a location perspective, we have one office in London. We focus on uh, the UK and Europe, but we're also building incubator businesses focusing on the US, which we started through COVID, uh, which are going really, really well. Um, and we will open our New York office in the summer of, of 23. So, you know, my background is in a nutshell, um, founding, scaling in a profitable 
traditional way, um, recruiting businesses and then and then moving them through uh, sales and exits um, on a on a you know now I've done three um, so reasonably reasonably comprehensive. Wow, yeah, there's a lot there. There's a shitload to talk about. You, uh, Hopefully and you're not, not too boring. You know, no, and you said. Well, you, what did you say to me? Because we spoke obviously previously. Did you say you were thirty-two when you sold Eximius? Uh, yeah, so I was twenty-three when I started Eximius. Yeah. If wow. That, if that works. Yeah. Right. So that's what I wanted to work out. So let's go backwards then. Um, yeah. When? Wh what age were you when you got into recruitment? So I graduated from Loughborough University. So uh, went to school in, in Sheffield in South Yorkshire. Um, played a lot of rugby as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. Went to, to Loughborough um, and uh, graduated there. Um, I actually, so my brother was very successful in software sales um, and he actually got me uh, three internships with IBM um, every summer uh, that I was at Loughborough. So every summer I used to go and spend uh, the summer basically shadowing different uh, software sales professionals at IBM which was a very interesting insight into high, high end, um, professional sales, you know, transactions sort of two to 20 million pounds, you know, lead time on deals of, you know, two to three mm. years, very, very different to contingent recruitment. Um, mm. so I guess when I graduated my, you know, my normal step would have been to go into software. Um, actually a family friend said, why don't you have a look at the world of recruitment? Um, I interviewed with, pretty much every firm that was worth interviewing with in London. Um, really? And I landed with um, what is now hydrogen, but what was then um, finance professionals, law professionals, HR professionals, audit professionals, which was basically the professionals half um, of the hydrogen business. So for those that know hydrogen in essence, back in the day had two halves of their business professionals and then partners. Um, mm -hmm. Partners was mainly tech focused, which I think where where you competed with the business, um, yeah. and then professionals was uh, was accountancy, legal, um, audit, HR, etc. Yeah, a lot, a bit, a bit like S three. A lot of really good people have come from that brand. Like obviously, I was I worked, when I worked, when I worked for Venquist, everyone was ex hydrogen, right? And it yeah. felt like there's a lot, lot of businesses have spun out of hydrogen now and, and gone off and either founded or become CEOs of other brands. Um, yeah. So it's, if, if you look at S3 is the one, I think that, you know, yeah. just found, yeah. founders everywhere and that would be yeah. one of the the, ne the next in line. Um, yeah. So like S3 obviously managed to achieve a lot more than, than, mm. than hydrogen have, um, you know, I think, I think hydrogen, you know, hydrogen were founded in 1997, they floated in 2006. Um, I think, you know, that business is a real game of two halves, you know, that, that first half for them. I think it was an amazing, amazing time. And I was part of that business when, you know, it was an electric place to be. It was, you know, super entrepreneurial, very, very energetic. It was, you know, had super high caliber people in it. You know, the, the numbers that they were doing were, were quite silly um, in the markets they were in. They very much, you know, got to a dominant position very, very quickly. So, um, and I think, you know, post, you know, post floating, I think that was a challenge for them. I think they floated when they were too small. Um, and I think that sort of, created challenges for the organization for nearly 10 years. And, you know, you can see that they've, you know, they've delisted um, uh, 18 why months would, ago. Why so would they, floating into when you're too small create challenges? Like, what do you mean by that? So they were, when when they floated, I think their headcount was about 250, 300 people. Um, they were, uh, you know, at that level, I think from a recruitment business perspective, you're still a very volatile entity. You know, you still mm. trade up and down, you know, you. You know, some months will be great, some months will be shocking. Um, and, you know, when you, if, you, if you're going to float a business, then you're going to, the aim is to attract investment from individuals who aren't specialists in the sector. Um, and I think a business of that size is, um, is too volatile to be publicly listed. Um, I don't right. think you can find any, I don't think you can find any, you know, I'm a bit of a recruitment geek, but I don't think you can find any recruitment business which is, uh, sub a thousand people that's floated that's a success um and you know definitely if you speak to the people who were senior at the likes of s3 um you know they did they did one transaction which was barclays when barclays had a private equity business um and then they didn't do another transaction until they floated the business and you know when they floated the business they were you know north of 1800 2000 employees um, and by that time you've got real scale you've got real consistency your business isn't it doesn't go up and down so much it is more consistent um, and for investors who are 
not recruitment savvy, um, they can buy into it. And I think, you know, the, the hydrogen had as being a listed entity is that, you know, they were, they were still far too uh, volatile um, and investors didn't understand, it didn't understand the business. And for that reason, so did that, didn't again, I, right. So that was the problem then it lacked, like didn't get the investment it should have got and people. Yeah. You know, if you look yeah. at the equity exchange on, you know, on point of, on point of flotation or thereafter, there wasn't a lot of movement. Um, and, you know, that's purely because, you know, investors, uh, don't want to put their don't want to put their capital in. So, and, and you know, I think if you speak to a lot of people, oh, the lights gone off. Here. Um, if you speak <laughs> to a lot of people. This is real, real podcasting when the light goes off. There you go. Really love it. Um, if you speak, if you speak to a lot of people who you know have scaled significant businesses or invest in recruitment businesses, you know, I think sub a thousand people, you are best with private equity investment or best with um high net worth investment and i think that's what you see you know in the in the sector um so you know i was with hydrogen it was fantastic business i really enjoyed my time there um how do you did you what type of were you a really strong recruiter or did you i was not bad yeah yeah so did did you see that as like you strike me because of the age you've done everything you strike me as you probably saw beyond being a recruiter quite quick and you were more like the business and the growth and like, yeah, am I right? Uh, right? Look, I, I think I, I loved Hydra. I think it was a great business. You know, it floated, it changed slightly. But, you know, in essence, um, you know, the reason that the main reasons that I left is that I was too late for real equity in that company. Um, I didn't see a way to actually be able to achieve, you know, a meaningful amount of equity in that company. Um, and also, I, I thought, you know, I thought the business as it floated was changing into an organization that probably didn't suit me and my capability that well um and you know I, I think one of the sort of big misconceptions with people in recruitment you know there's low barriers to entries to start starting an agency but you know whatever the stat is 87 percent of uk recruitment businesses are less than 10 people yeah, uh, yeah um and i think you know i i'm a big advocate of people having really successful careers within successful recruitment co companies um and and you know, having been somebody who started a number of these companies, you know, it's not a quick way to make money. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think that they're going to start their recruitment business because they're going to increase their earnings. And, you know, unless you are going to keep that very, very small, potentially just yourself, you know, I think a lot of people are very, very mistaken there because, you know, the level of investment that you need to basically grow and develop a recruitment business with any level of meaning is significant. Um, so, you know, I, I, if I had my time again, you know, and if Hydrogen was in a different space, you know, I may have, you know, I may have stayed within that business. But I think I was a bit too late in that business in terms of its um, its its position to really get a meaningful, meaningful right. uh, stake. So then you went from there and set up Eximius? Yeah, so I launched Eximius in January 2008. Uh, so we focused on accountancy into the banking sector, which was my core market. Um and Which, how old are you? 23, uh, did you say? 23, 24, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's only a couple was, of years. How long were you at Hydrogen for? Three years, two years? Bang on three years, yeah. 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 So I did, I did, at Hydrogen, I did accountants into banks. Um, and, you know, very transparently, I, you know, uh, developed that, you know, developed a very, very good understanding of that market and um, got a very strong uh, client following in that market very, very quickly. Did you get into, did you lead teams and in, in yeah, I did. Yeah, no, I, did, no, I was definitely still billing, but I was, I was definitely, leading, yeah, I was leading teams. Um, and you know, we, we, we sort of moved, we moved that business more into sort of project recruitment. So, um, you know, it was the time when banks in London were looking to hire a lot of newly qualified ACAs. Um, at, at the time they would, the vast majority of them were doing it on one on ad hoc hiring. So, you know, you had hundreds of hiring managers all running around interviewing people all the time. Um, and we basically moved that more into project recruitment. So we did more um, open days um, assessment centers where, you know, we would actually run that exclusively or on a retained basis for the bank. Um, and, you know, they would look to hire 15 to 20 newly qualified accountants in one, in one evening. Um, and once we'd sort of done that once or twice, we then managed to showcase that 
with a number of other banks. And then before we knew it, we picked up, you know, a significant wow. number of the tier one houses on a retained basis, running all of their accountancy hiring. So, wow. you know, and, and that catapulted that business forward quite quickly. And, you know, we did, we managed to get that off the ground at Eximius as well. So, um, yeah, Eximius, we launched in January 2008. Um, if was that you just uh, was just there you? was, there was three of us um, right. that kickstarted that business. Um, and, you know, if you recall, that's, an interesting year to start a business focusing on financial services. So Lehman Brothers went bankrupt in September. Um, Bear Stearns went down just before that. Um, you know, actually, I, I really enjoyed that period and we had a lot of success. We were young, we were nimble. We didn't have the size and the structure and the overheads of larger accountancy banking recruiters. Um, and actually, you know, if you were bright and if you were smart, there was quite a lot of angles to make quite a lot of revenue in that market. So, you know, it wasn't that all banks weren't hiring, um, but, you know, it was, it was a very interesting market, I would say. What did you do? What, what, give us market. some examples of the pivot or the strategies you used to keep revenue coming in in such a difficult time. Uh, well, I think, you know, firstly, you know, when Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers go bankrupt, there's quite a lot of high caliber candidates on the market quite quickly. Um, mm. And, you know, um, you know, the, you, you want to be the first mover there in terms of, you know, engaging with all of those candidates and making sure that you're working with them on an exclusive basis and making sure mm. that, you know, the banks that are hiring um, are hiring that talent pool through you. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think that all moved, you know, frankly, I think that all moved so quickly. And I also think organizations were in such uh, disarray that internal teams weren't really doing that for whatever reason. Um, yeah. So, you know, we made a lot of revenue through 2008, 2009, um, moving people who had been, you know, part of, unfortunately, um, you know, that that position with Bear Stearns and with Lehman Brothers. Um, and, you know, also we were placing, you know, we were sort of, we weren't in the compliance risk uh, space at that point in time, but, you know, still we were in the accountancy space, which was sort of one of the, you know, control functions of an investment bank. And it was still sort of relatively hot in terms of a market, especially when, you know, large institutional investment banks were going bankrupt. Um, you know, there was still some demand. So, you know, I think I've always said, you know, if you're if you're if you're a tiny player in a massive pond, you know, that is a that's a great time to be in a recession because, you know, <laughs> the, the market can shrink by you know, 20, 30, 40, 50%. Well, you know, if you only occupy a very small percentage of that opportunity, you can continue growing in a, in a shrinking market. Um, you know, if you're if you're running a platform at, at the point in time where you occupy the vast majority of the market and the market shrinks by 40%, then you've got a major headache. But, you know, if you're yeah. a startup business scaling into what is a reducing market, you know, you can still deliver good quality growth. A message from today's sponsor. So um, everyone knows Vincere, right? Everyone knows the all-in-one platform of choice. They're growing like wildfire. But what you might not know is they're hiring. So a bit like Hoxo, they love to get the ex-recruitment community to join them. So if you're a recruiter looking to switch careers and move into tech, this is your chance, right? Vincere are hiring a variety of roles across all of their offices to join sales, customer success and implementation. So different stages of the journey, they need people who can impact their recruitment clients and having an ex-recruiter learn the technology um, is a huge um, asset and, and it works, right? So you can learn more about Vincere on their LinkedIn or their Instagram um, for behind the scenes updates um, and their careers page at careers.vincere for hyphen digital.io join the team. The link, which I've not pronounced very well, is in the comments and in the, um, in the write-up section attached to this episode. The the Eximius brand. Was, you said there was yeah. three. What did you? What? How did that? How was it split in terms of what you guys did? Okay, so well, the Eximius journey. So we, if you look at the the, the business, you know, Eximius is a professional services recruiter. Um, mm -hmm. It you know it, it it mainly focuses on uh, financial services and legal as, as sectors. Right. Um, you know, we we that is the business as it is today. Um, we also built uh, two additional businesses. So we built an energy business, which was um, called Eximius Energy. And we also um, built a social care and educational recruitment business. Um, and they were, when we kickstarted them, they were Eximius Social Care and Eximius Education. Um, we very, very quickly realized in both of those businesses that we had, firstly, 
um, those markets that I'd had no experience of was very, very different. And they needed to be in a different environment with a different culture, with a different brand. Um, and secondly, uh, the leader that we had in that in that part of the business, unfortunately, wasn't fit for purpose. It was an individual who'd come from Hayes to join us, um, right. which had been part of Hayes for 20 years. And, and you know, honestly, you know, we were probably a 50, 60 person recruiter at that point in time. Um, and, you know, I think the skill of being successful in a 50, 60 person recruitment business is very, very different to being successful at Hayes. Um, and, you know, so we, we did two things with that business. Firstly, um, we found somebody who was super fit for purpose in terms of scaling um, an education and social care business. And secondly, mm -hmm. we rebranded re that business as Tempest Resourcing. Um, right. And, you know, that business, you know, if you, if you look at Tempest, you know, Tempest is a 40 million revenue business today. Um, you know, we sold uh, i sold my interest in that business in 2016 so you know through eximius in essence you know you've got eximius which has financial services and, and legal um which is you know very much the business that it is today um you mm -hmm. know that's a 20 25 million pound revenue business um we led it through you know quite progressive growth over an eight year period it was always the plan to basically sell that business through an mbo so we we constructed an MBO in 2016. Um, we thought it would take longer, but we got, you know, we got there very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, I think that MBO model in recruitment is really, really positive. You know, it offers good value for the shareholders who are exiting. Um, it also offers a real opportunity for the, you know, the team to step up into being a shareholder in a, so how in do a you start, valuable business. I think it's a really good, in, interesting topic and you don't hear enough of it going on, I don't think. Um, how do you even start something like this? So if I'm a founder listening now, and I'm thinking, right, yeah. you know what? I'm building a nice leadership team. You know, I've got a yeah. strong business that's growing. How do I, what steps do I need to take to, to introduce the idea and then make it happen? Yeah. So I would say it's not something you want to do overnight. I think, you know, it's definitely something you want to do over quite a prolonged period of time. Um, yeah, I, th I, think, I think the first question that you need to ask yourself as a founder is, do you genuinely want to step away from the business or not? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, uh, I think, you know, just like a lot of people, in recruitment think you know the the sort of golden opportunity is starting your own agency and i would you know i would uh, aggressively argue that is not always the best route for people yeah i think there's a lot of you know I, I talk about entrepreneurs a lot i think there's a lot of people that i know who are super successful entrepreneurs that are very very successful in very successful recruitment businesses that earn a lot of money that have shared holdings in that business who are going to you know realize capital at, at a point of event um you know if if you are a founder of a business and if you've got some scale to that business i think that's the first thing um i think the first thing to to understand is you know do you genuinely want to step away from that business um you know i think you want to think long and hard about that i think a lot of people think they do um i think in reality you know if you if you sell a recruitment business and i, I can say by you know experience you know, starting another one is not quick. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, if you've got your business to, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 people, um, you know, recreating that opportunity again for yourself is going to be pretty hard and pretty painful, frankly. Um, and, you know, you probably want to think about whether you're at what point in your journey you're in, you know, are you, can you put an MBO together and you're going to retire? In which case that's pretty straightforward. You know, if you're not at that point in your career, do you genuinely want to, to to step away from the business? If the answer is yes, um, then I think you need to take a long, hard look and you know an honest look in your in, inside of your management team. Um, they need to, you know, the obvious thing to say is they need to be able to run the business without your assistance. Um, you know, there is no point in MBOing a business with a management team that then can't operationally run that entity um, okay. because the thing will fall okay. over. So, you know, I would recommend that you have at least a 12 month period where that management team is pretty much operationally running the business. Um, and then, you know, I think you need to in, engage with you know good quality uh, legal and accounting advice um, to make sure that you're structuring the thing effectively and also, you know, offer that advice to the management team as well. Um, you know, there's there's no MBO where well, there shouldn't be an MBO where the management team don't take personal risk. So, you know, the, you know, the, the Eximius MBO, there's, you know, there's five partners who have taken that business on and, and moving it forward. Um, and they've all got personal risk on the table. And, 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 and rightly so, you know, they've become shareholders in a meaningful business. We put an MBO together um, and as part of that MBO, 
um, you know, they have to move forward with a level of personal risk attached to that company. And, you know, if if that isn't explained to people up front, you know, if they get that at the 11th hour, you know, either, um, you know, that's going to be quite challenging to manage in terms of communication. What, can you give, can you be more apart. specific? Can you be a bit more specific with the level of personal risk? Like, what does that look like? Well, you're going to, you're going to have personal guarantees, um, which are going to be linked personally to you and your assets. So, you know, if you're, yeah. if you're a property owner, um, you know, you're going to, you know, do not expect that you're going to be able to be a partner MBOing a recruitment business with any size and scale and value without um, needing to attach a level of personal guarantees and personal risk to yourself. Um, yeah. And, you know, that, that, you know, that will run forward for, you know, the, 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 the duration of the payouts. Um, so, you know, and, and then I think, uh, you know, the other thing that I think, you know, people who successfully do MBOs in terms of the management team coming through, you know, they sort of really buy in and appreciate the value in the business that's being created as well. So, um, you know, it's a team game, but, you know, a lot of people have worked very, very hard to create this asset. Um, and if you're going to be part of the management team who's coming through to, to take that off the owners, then you need to also have a long, hard think about whether you buy into the value of that asset or not. Yeah. Because at and the end of the day, you're going to attach your own, you know, personal risk to that asset. So, you know, you're, 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 was it if you're in a, your instance, you're in a house, was it a, you're going to attach that to that business. Yeah. Yeah. In your instance, was it, was it a situation where you and the other founders, the original founders, like, you know, identified the management team and then brought it and then presented, look, this is something we would like and this is how it would look and then let them think about it. And because it, or was it more the management team saying to you, look, are you ready now? And it, like, we've always yeah. known this was the plan. Are you ready now? Like, how did that all begin? No, it was the former. So, you know, mm. over, I would say, a two to two and a half year period, um, you know, we were communicating and engaging with that team um, and, you know, understanding, you know, a, 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 the level of appetite, you know, B, let's be really transparent about what that deal may or may not look like. Um, not, not just for us, but for you. Um, and, you know, let's only invest, you know, two, two and a half years going down this journey if we're all actually bought into the outcome that it's going to produce. Mm. Um, and, you know, we, we all know recruitment businesses, they are, they are volatile beasts. And, um, you know, the, the people need to have a level of, 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 of personal risk that they're willing to and did to those to five it. people stay on track throughout that time or did they wobble was there some yeah so you know super transparently so there was uh i would say there's probably two other people who you know were well there was, there was it was when we did the mbo there was six that's come down to five um i would say pre the mbo there was probably seven that came down to six that's now gone mm. down to five so you know i think it, i I just think as a founder, you've got to start with your own personal position. You know, do you want to step away from the business? Why do you want to step away from the business? Um, are you thinking you're going to recreate another entity? If so, have yeah. you genuinely thought about how hard that's going to be? Because, you know, the brain, the, the human brain is very good at forgetting the hard times. You know, oh, I've got this great business. It was really easy to create. Well, in reality, it wasn't. It no. was bloody hard to create. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're going to go and recreate a business again, you know, why, why are you going to do that? Is it that and what, if you if you ask those questions, if you answer those questions, how you thought at the eximius time? Yeah. What was going through your head? Like, why did you make those? Why were you so clear? Like, what were your answers to those questions, effectively? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, look for me personally, um, it was the right for, for me personally. It was the right deal to do for the for a few reasons that hopefully pretty well fall through. So the first one was, you know, I don't, you know. I don't come from any personal wealth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my mum worked for a charity all her life. My dad was a teacher. Um, we had a really nice life, but there was no, you know, there wasn't excess funds. Um, yeah. You know, as I mentioned at the start, I actually played loads of rugby as a kid. Um, you know, for the for the good or bad, rugby is full of people from pretty wealthy backgrounds, and I yeah, hung out yeah. with you know a lot of my mates were rugby mates, and a lot of my mates, frankly, had quite a lot of cash. Um, and you know, I genuinely had a motivation to to to, to create personal wealth. Um, and you know, I'd also I had kids young, so I had my first daughter when I was twenty eight. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, doing doing the MBO Eximius, um, selling my interest in in, in Tempest, 
Um, you know, the other thing that we did is we had an energy team within Eximius. We hived that out. We ran a trade sale and we sold that to a competitor called Aver Energy. So Aver Energy are, a, you know, six to eight million pounds turnover business. So, you know, doing the combination of those transactions, you know, changed my financial outlook um, quite considerably and, and, you know, put me on a put me on a, a playing field that, you know, for me was a particularly motivating uh, place to be. Um, and also, you know, very transparently, um, you know, I've got a lot of ambition to scale a significantly large recruitment business. Um, and, you know, I relish the opportunity to basically take all of my learns um, and to take my own financial cash um, and invest that into a project, which is obviously 94 um, and commit to that longer term and, and grow that grow that to a significant scale. So in to recap there, to make sure. So you you already knew like creating wealth was kind of the first objective, but then you also already had the foresight that you probably were going to do this again on your own without. I was definitely going to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You Did know, they you know? Did your founder partners know that? Absolutely. Yeah. You've got to be transparent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got, you can look at the recruiter advert on the Eximius MBO, you know, and, and, you know, I'm stated there saying, you know, I'm going to have some time off and then I'm going to launch a professional services recruiter. Um, mm. And, you know, 94 is, is a professional services recruiter. So, you know, I'm a super transparent individual and, um, you know, uh, there's, you, you know, there's, there's no point in trying to, uh, I'm not a fan no. of trying to basically hide anything there. I think it's wicked. I think that, that's the, the, I think clarity in where you're going is one of the biggest things that most people crave and but actually struggle to create. And I feel right now in my life, like I, I have a personal coach I speak to every week. Hang on, hang on. Um, <laughs> this is hilarious, Ed. You're in one of those offices that the lights just go off. Um, for anyone who's listening, every tw 15 minutes, we're bang on half an hour. Every 15 minutes, Ed's light will go off. So just, you know, anyway. Um, That's looking after, the, uh, looking after the globe. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, but well, I was chatting to my personal coach last night about my life and my business interests and everything. And I, the one word he used was, you seem so clear, Sean. Like you, there's clarity there. And yeah. I would say that there's been a lot of times in my previous five years of Hoxo, I've not been very clear on where we're going and where I'm heading and, and yeah. it's a it's a really nice feeling, and it sounds like you you know you you managed to have that. Um, what what did it feel? But I like? think also what... you come with you know you, you get a lot of learns, right? You know, I think I'm not I'm not uh, not naive to think like everything was great and everything worked, yeah. and you know we we made a lot of errors, and um, I genuinely think the bright people in life you know reflect on the errors and try you know try not to make them twice is my rule, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I did did take a lot of time post leaving Eximius to basically think, right, what went what went right there? What didn't go so right? And if we're going to do it again, Stevens, you know, let's make sure that we actually learn from that and, and, and double down and, and, you know, get the benefit of those lessons. How did that feel when you were, and I imagine it was a life changing amount of money, right? Was it enough that you could have retired and stopped working? Like, did you... Was it, was it enough? Uh, I think that's just dependent on the lifestyle. That, you know, I'm not, I don't have a crazy lifestyle, but I think, hmm. uh, you know, I was 32. I don't, yeah. You could have probably got there. Yeah. But so how did it feel to be thinking about it all your life, especially being surrounded by the rugby kids? Like, I, yeah. you know, I'm not from that world. I never played rugby, so I didn't have any of those mates. But I know, I know how you would have grown up and how you'd have felt. Um, what, what did it feel to finally get there? Was it was it as good as it you'd expected? Uh, it's super, you know, it's super exciting, and you know, I think for a short period of time, you know, you you you, know, you you don't have any demands. You know, I you know, literally the deal was done, and I could walk. You know, that day, um, you know, we didn't have a lengthy earn out. You know, I could I could sign the sign the contract and and go. Um, and uh, you know, that 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 was super exciting. You know, what did you do that day? There was no emails. Uh, Drank quite a lot uh, and <laughs> uh, had dinner with my wife. Um, but you know, there was you know, you go from being you know, I do work very very hard. I've got a very very good work ethic, and um, you know, you go from being what I would class as you know, hundred hundred percent on to being you know, pretty off. And you know, for me, that was uh, you know, that was really nice. You know, my my eldest daughter was uh, what three and a half, four. You know, I had a period where you know, I took her to to, to preschool every single day, picked her up from preschool mm. every single day, you know, ate far too much ice cream with her, you know, hung out with her, you know, 
you know, these things don't often happen, but our second daughter was born, you know, in the middle of 2016. So I was, you know, bizarrely around, you know, loads for that period of time. We went to the south of France for a bit. Um, you know, it was a really nice period of time. Um, but, you know, I think I, I had no, I was very clear in my mind that I was going to go again. And, yeah. um, you know, there was a question on obviously when, you know, I could have gone again the week after, or I could have taken a proper period of time. And, you know, I was really focused on, I wanted to take a proper period of time to, to relax, to chill, to recharge, to think about what was good, what was bad, um, you know, what worked, what didn't work. If, if I am going to commit to doing this again, you know, uh, you know, make sure that we've got the right foundations and, you know, 94, you know, for anybody that knows us, you know, we are, you know, we are very, very, very structured entity. And, you know, I am, for good or for bad, you know, I'm quite a structured guy. And, um, you know, we are building a business which has a real purpose and structure to it. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it, it's growing in a certain, a certain fashion. So let's, we'll get into that in a second. So you, 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 you sell the business, you walk away, you've got the South of France. How long were you out for? What's the period of time that you had off? Uh, uh, just under a year. Right. Um, I got pretty now, bored at the back end of that, to be completely honest. I bet. But, but one thing I usually get from people is it's an un, it's underwhelming. Some people have said it was like the hardest year of their life, the hardest time of their life when they've they've gone from always on, email, email, email. You know, they, they feel wanted and needed and suddenly yeah. it's like no one wants you, no one needs you. See, I didn't find sounds, that, actually. I, yeah. I disagree with that. But, but, you know, it was fortunate. You know, I, as I said, you know, it's not very often that these things collide with your life timing well. You know, I had, I had a young daughter who... I was delighted to spend loads of time with and I had my second daughter born in that year. So, you know, there was a lot to occupy me outside of, you know, oh, I don't have an email. But, to but what you to. said, but what you've said that's different than anyone else I've interviewed is you already knew what you were doing anyway. So you, you, yeah, no, you, yeah. you were like on, a, on an extended holiday. Rather than, Precise. I think, I think what, what, what the feeling of underwhelming and that sad, almost sadness that people have, ex, have, have expressed is because they don't know what's next and they haven't thought about yeah. it. They, all they've given a shit about is reaching that top of the mountain and they get yeah. there and they're like, fuck, what, what do I do now? Like, and that's why like, one of my clients has a business called Chapter Two. Um, yeah. And Chapter Two is because it is his, you know, he, he sold his stakes in the business and he's, he's gone again. And, yeah. I, you know, it's a brilliant name. I love it. And, and it's that second horizon that I think people need to be, are mindful of that is going to happen. Like if you're in your thirties or your forties, even your fifties, sixties, unless you're someone who is genuinely happy to do nothing, you're going to want to yeah. do something again. But, um, but that comes down, Sean, to, to planning it, right? You know, I, hmm. you know, when you said, how would you plan an MBA? Well, the first thing that I would ask a founder to think about is do they genuinely want to step away from the business and what are they going to do thereafter? You know, if, if they're 70 and they're going to step away and retire, then that's cool. That's a pretty easy conversation to have. You know, if they're if they're 20, 30, 40, you know, are you honestly going to not do anything for the rest of your days? It seems pretty boring to me. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, for me, I was, I was very, very focused. Um, you know, my my professional ambition uh, and I believe my skill set, you know, I felt could run a lot further than what you know we'd achieved at Eximius. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was excited about doing that transaction. I thought it made... You know, a lot of personal sense for me as a shareholder. I thought it made really, really good sense for the the, the partners who had basically taken the business off on post us. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was a win-win in terms of the opportunity. I think that you know the 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 selling the energy business to Aver Energy, I think, was a really, really good um, move that that made sense for both us and for Aver Energy. And also selling down my 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 shareholding in Tempest Resourcing was really good. Um, as well. So, you know, in 2016, I put those three things together. Um, and, you know, I think all of that was reasonably well thought through. Um, but I was very, very clear on what, you know, what the next steps were going to be. One thing I wasn't clear on how long that was going to be, I, I kept a pretty, kept a pretty uh, sort of open mind around, is this going to be, you know, three months, six months, nine months, 18 months, two years. Um, and, I, you know, I just, I, thought you know i've worked bloody hard for quite a long period of time now yeah 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 um you know i'll, I'll basically go back to the market when i feel i've got when the energy ready. to do it again. Yeah. so tell us where does the name 94 come from uh so i wanted 
I'm surprised that you can pronounce Eximius because um, one of our biggest customers still used to call us Eximus, which uh, <laughs> I must admit really got under I think I've just heard people say Eximius a few times. Yeah, yeah. So um, look, I, it means it means exceptional in Latin. So um, you know, I think uh, firstly, I wanted. You know, I'm heavily dyslexic, so quite weird for a founder to come up with a company name called Eximius, which is so hard to say and spell. Yeah. But, um, you know, I wanted a company name that was super easy to pronounce. Um, I also frankly thought like having a number was a bit cooler than having a name. Yeah, it's different, um, yeah. I tried to buy 84. So 84 is the year that I was born. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, for anybody who's done this, you know, I, want, I wanted to buy up, you know, all of the URLs and have all of the company house registrations. So you need to be pretty organized. Um, 84 wasn't available. I went every single year, 85, 86, 87. Um, weirdly, I got to 94 and everything was available. So, you know, we own, you know, 94 group, 94 tax, 94 legal, 94 compliance, 94 risk, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, I bought it all up one night um, and then I woke up in the middle of the night thinking what the hell happened in 1994 that meant that everything was available um, and after uh, quite a lot of googling I figured out that it was quite a boring year nothing happened so you know, <laughs> that's that is why it's called 94. Yeah, England didn't make the World Cup that's what I know about 94. That is yeah there you go but yeah. no, you know no, yeah. no no no. It's my first no. memory of football though is 94 World Cup when Maradona scored and ran up to the screen and um, it, it, Brazil and Italy in the final. It, I'm half Irish and Ray Houghton scored for Ireland against Italy. And I remember that's my first year of remembering football. Um, there you go. You got yeah. the football knowledge. You know, I'm more of a yeah. rugby guy, so I, I, I didn't, I didn't know any of that. <laughs> Fair. Our second sponsor, as you know, District Four. Um, these guys empower the startup community um, and the scale up community to effectively do what they do best and enjoy the part of the job. They It's probably the opposite of what the episode, today's episode with Ed is all about. Um, it's more about, you know, do you feel like you're, you're not surrounded by peers uh, and you've stopped learning? You know, imagine only working alongside other experienced recruiters who you can collaborate with, but also enjoy having the freedom of doing it your way. Like today I'm working from my own office, um, but I'm dialed into so many people. It's kind of like working within a network of experienced recruiters that are all billing lots of money um, to grow the business. And District 4 will take off away all the back end so you can get focused on what you do best and grow the business your way. Um, if you're interested to find out how they can support you, then go to www.district4.io forward slash Hoxo. Okay, so talk us through the journey of 94. So you, you said this is going to be your money, just you. Yeah. What's Talk us through the like how it's progressed over the last five years from from day one yeah yeah so um to, to go over the company setup first and the company structure and, and hope you know mm. this will link into um you know how we're progressing so the first thing is we're a single single founder business so there's only one founder here and, it, and, it, and it's me um i genuinely think that is a massive benefit fit for the team um you know i study recruitment companies quite a lot um most recruitment companies grow and then hit a flat and they they find it hard to ever go past that flat um you know most of the time when recruitment companies stop growing it's because of shareholder dispute um, and it's usually because you know the company become worth something um and then all of a sudden the shareholders start realizing that and they have a bit of a disagreement about you know who's going to get paid what, who's going to have the big job, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, I am a pretty well-researched individual. And for me, you know, if I didn't fall out myself, then, you know, we wouldn't <laughs> have the fair, the founder shareholder dispute, which means that hopefully we can, you know, we can keep growing. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is we're hundred percent self-funded. So, you know, it's all my capital that's at risk. Um, you know, it's all my funding that I've put into the company to enable it to grow. Um, and, you know, I think, having one founder and not having an investor um, means that we've got a lot of equity that's free in the business. Um, and, you know, that enables, uh, you know, us to offer, you know, we, we've got an equity scheme, which is, you know, super generous. It's offering 40% of the company um, to the team. Um, and, you know, we've got transaction objectives so that, you know, as we go through transactions, individuals who have achieved equity within the company will have an opportunity to, to exchange that at those shares for cash if they want to. So, you know, the first thing is, 
uh, there's one founder, so we don't have shareholder dispute. Um, it's self-funded, so we don't have an investor who's, you know, rightly so asked for a significant slug of the equity. Um, we are 100% organically grown. So, you know, this is very, very different to most agencies. And, you know, it, it, it's quite a slow start in my experience. So, you know, it takes a while to get this going. But, you know, the only person to have worked in another agency is me. You know, everybody else has joined this business as an entry level recruiter, um, either as a graduate or as an entry level individual. We're not, you know, we're not focused on just graduates. We'll hire people from, you know, sales backgrounds, et cetera. Um, but no, Nobody has joined this business with recruitment experience. So, you know, we are 100% focused. So on how, do you, how do you get that off the ground then? So I can see that later later down the line, but the, the early yeah. days when it's just you and, yeah. and graduates, are you the yeah. guy then on the phone and doing deals? I am, yeah. Yeah. And training exactly. and developing and coaching and mentoring, you know. And, you know, I've... Uh, you know that that's that. I think that's a quite a slow start, and you've got to be mm. quite uh, you've got to be quite patient with people. You know, I could have gone and hired you know four people with five years' experience from my competitors, and you know some people would say you know that that would be a better way to do it. You know, my strong belief was um, having that pure organic model. You know, if you do your research on firms that really do scale, um, you know those organisations pretty much bar not are massively organically focused and very much mm. focused on that graduate and entry level so you know and, I, and i've got a big you know we're, we're very much focused on you know the gen z um and you know those individuals are you know born in between 97 and, and 2012. um you know i'm a massive believer in the fact that young people if they're ambitious and if they're given the opportunity and if they're invested into from a training and development perspective can in this sector, you know, perform really, really well. Um, and, you know, you know, we're, we're building a platform with that, that in mind. Um, and then also it means that, you know, all of our profit is reinvested into our growth and all of that growth is going to the team internally. You know, it's not that, you know, somebody's performing exceptionally well on our platform and then we're using the profit that they're creating to go and take a competitor and bring that person in and give them the opportunity. You know, all of the opportunity is available just to the team internally who yeah. are the ones that have enabled us to get to the position that we're in and look the idea of this is so a crystal clear like, i get it i totally get it yeah. and i love it and it's the most unique conversation in some ways i've had on this show but i still think i'm just trying to get into your mindset of what was it like going from eximius founder yeah. through this business exit had a year out with your kids to then yeah. being back on the phone ringing candidates and yeah. You know, dealing with at this, the questions you must have been getting asked by your team and yeah. the shit when things fall out and go wrong and you're like, yeah. yeah, obviously financially, I'm sure you've got such a nice buffer that you're not, you weren't worried about the, the simple transactions. You were probably, sure. you would give yourself time to get it right. But what yeah. was that? What was the, how did you get yourself into the mindset to, to want well, to do just got, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in you got to, you know, only do things like you are, where, you are where you are is a good saying. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other thing is, you know, don't put yourself into a position that you haven't thought about. And then when you're in that position, don't complain about it. You know, yeah, cause you put yourself I, there. I precisely, I, you know, it was, it was mm. my decision to decide that I was going to build a, my second agency mm. organically. So, you know, there's no point whinging about the fact that, you know, I've then got a room full of graduates because I've decided <laughs> to do that. So, you know, you know, I, I'm a big believer in just think, think your decisions through and then don't whinge about them. Um, but, you know, I think there's, uh, yeah, I think there's benefits and drawbacks to it. And, I, th I, you know, the hockey stick analogy is really, really true with this business. You know, mm. it takes time before, you know, when you hire somebody with no experience, you know, our, our first, you know, my first hire, you know, he, um, a guy called Glenn Toby. So, you know, he uh, went to university, decided that he didn't want to do his degree and get into a load of debt. He left, he joined um, an estate agency. Uh, and then, you know, he thought, actually, I can probably do a bit better than this. Um, and he joined 94 as our first hire. Um, you know, like with everybody that was in that cohort, you know, I've trained them, I've developed them, I've coached them. Um, you know, he's four and a half years on. You know, he's now running a business of 25 people. Um, you know, they are, you know, he's four and a half years into his career. You know, he's, he's going to end this year on 30, 35 people. He'll double that next year. He'll have a business of... You know 60 people next year so you know the, the you, you've got to believe in the in the plan well did, uh, how long did it take for him to see revenue and and performance for himself how long did that take uh 
uh, he billed honestly. Um, you know, we were pretty good at getting graduates billing in their second month with us. Uh, but, you know, it's not just, you know, it's not just my training. You know, we have, so we're, we're purely organic. Um, we're going to stay purely organic. We're going to stay reinvesting into the business. We're going to stay offering all of the opportunities to the team. Um, but, you know, come with that, you know, we are a recruitment business, but also we're a training business. Um, mm. And, you know, so we have an unbelievably structured training program. So, you know, when you join us as an associate consultant, you go on a five day boot camp led by a guy called James Bass, who trained me as a graduate. Um, you know, he does all of our training. Um, but then also, you know, there's nothing revolutionary about having a boot camp training course for your graduates. But then also we don't just train the graduates and then leave them to it. So when you're promoted to a senior consultant, there's a senior consultant training program. When you're promoted to an AVP, there's an AVP training program. When you're promoted to a VP, there's a VP training program. So, you know, the, the whole process there is that we are constantly training and developing our staff to enable them to be, you know, the best versions that they can. Um, and, you know, if you, if you hire really good quality people and if you've got a culture and environment that is attractive to, you know, that generation, I do think you need to think about that because, you know, they call me old. I don't think I'm particularly old, but, you know, <laughs> what, what they want to do and what I want to do is slightly different. And you need to create an yeah. environment which I genuinely believe is a fun place to be. Um, if you've got your training structure and you've got that model really working well, if you if you're willing to invest and you've got the financial capital to invest so that you can then scale teams with these people you know we've got you know successful people in year one are finishing their first year with you know leading two or three people um successful people in their second year are finishing their year leading five to six people so you know we're what about investing. billings what about what are you looking at from a billing perspective from if they're getting through the year one and they're already leading two to three what's that that desk and team responsible for yeah. hitting at the end of the year. Yeah. So we're again, super structured. So you don't have a billing target in your first month, nor your second month in your third month, you do have a billing target. And then that billing target does increase as you become more senior within the business. Um, and that is all recorded on a centralized, you know, centralized uh, sales plan. So that, you know, mm -hmm. if you're leading a team, you can view where you're up to against your budget the whole time. Um, and, you know, the, the, the next part of the process is, you know, offer, you know, we've recruited really high caliber, really high quality individuals, you know, and we've trained people really well, you know, offer people really fast progression. Um, and, you know, we're enabling people to progress their careers, you know, on the 94 platform very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, if, if you get all of that right, you know, people are frankly, you know, earning really well. Um, you know, we're, we don't pay people in line with the number of years of experience they've got. We pay people in line with the job that they're doing. Um, so, you know, people are progressing, you know, base salary and commission and bonuses very, very quickly. Um, and then we've got an equity program. There you go again. Um, <laughs> it literally is every 15 minutes. <laughs> this is and then we We've got an equity program where 40 percent of the company is available for the team and you know we're also transparent that's not there for big billers you know that is there for leaders so you know and and, and that is very very structured and you know the, the the bigger your team the bigger your target the bigger your deliverables the more shares you get in the company um and you know we're also pretty focused in terms of what we're going to do in terms of scaling and what we're going to do in terms of transactions so you know it, it is very very structured well we'll get into that i mean this is going to run a little bit longer than I probably planned because I'm just totally uh, engrossed in this conversation. Um, but the in terms, that's it. I love it. But how did you handle the pandemic then? A junior team, yeah, training through, um, yeah. and it's kind of two part question. How did you handle the pandemic? I don't need to go into mad detail about COVID. We've yeah. talked about yeah. it forever, but more from a working practice, um, and then. Yeah. How have you come out of the pandemic and have you changed anything around like, you know, five days in the office, the way that you drive yeah. the culture, that kind of stuff? Two part question. Yeah. So I guess like super quickly. So 2017, we started in tax. So um, I'd actually never done the tax market, but I got a reasonably significant hands off. Um, and I basically hunted around looking for markets that I could operate in that I thought were vaguely interesting. And the tax one was super engaging. So uh, 2017, we, we kickstart uh, tax. Um, 2018, we kickstart our technology business. 2019, we kickstart our legal business. Um, mm -hmm. 2020, this thing called COVID happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, through COVID, the the brief, uh, you know, the brief position on that was, uh, I guess, threefold. The first one is we didn't let anybody go. 
but we didn't hire anybody for the entirety of the year. And if I had my time again, I'd have probably started hiring slight. We hired, started hiring again in January 21. If I had my time again, I'd probably start hiring in September of 20. So yeah. we didn't let anybody go. Um, we did use furlough for the first quarter, but then we brought everybody back from July, from Q3 onwards. Um, and we did a number of things. Uh, we started our US adventure in 2020 in COVID. Um, so, um, you know, we, we viewed that our markets had shrunk quite a lot and that we needed to probably cover a bit more landscape. So um, we pushed out into, uh, into the US in 2020, which has been a fantastic, you know, an amazing journey um, for us. You know, a guy called Hugo Potts, you know, started building our US legal business in the middle of COVID. Um, he'd never placed a lawyer. He'd never placed anybody in the United States. You know, he's now got, you know, an eight person team placing wow. lawyers into private practice firms across across the United States. And he's you know going to be one of the key people who's going to lead us out there next year. Um, so, you know, we did do some sort of good strategic things like like that. Um, I think also I very quickly took a view, which was, you know, I wasn't billing, frankly, as we went into the end of 19. Um, I quite quickly took a look at the business and realized, you know, look, Stevens, get back on the phone. Um, so, you know, and, and I, I put myself into a market that I'd actually never recruited in um, and had a really positive year you know did did frankly a, a ridiculous amount of billings and uh, you know that was positive from a financial perspective but it was also positive for everybody to see that yeah. you know the market is there you can make it um you know you've got to be a market maker um you've got to be super commercial but you know you, you can make money um and then you know i think look as everybody in the staffing and recruitment sector is senior you know, the market has bounced ridiculously quickly so you know 2021 um you know, we have just just closed our accounts. You know, we grew um, revenue, uh, GP and headcount by well over 200 percent in the year. So, mm -hmm. you know, we really did take advantage of the bounce back. And, you know, my view was quite clear, which was, you know, we're going to, you know, the market is bouncing. It's very, very, you know, it's very frothy. Um, there's a lot of opportunity and we're going to we're going to scale into that quite quickly. So, you know, we hugely increased headcount through 2021. Um, came with you know following that we increased our GP and our revenue um, and our profit. So you know that that then in essence has created the foundation now to 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 move the business over on. the coming years. Yeah. In terms of the but what working from home, yeah, that generation, you know, yeah, like this business is so like the bizarre, you know, the bizarre thing about that. So I remember when we closed the office when COVID really <clears> kicked <throat> off, and the people who said to me, "I'm going to love working from home." Not all of them, but pretty much those were the ones that hated it. The people that said, I'm going to hate it, pretty much loved it. So I think mm. the first thing is you can never predict what how somebody's going to react to a situation. Um, and, you know, we did work from home um, in that really beginning start, April, May, June. Um, and then we basically said, if you're a graduate or if you're a manager, you come back to the office. If you experience, continue working from home, just so we had a bit more space in the office. Um, but then, you know, we did move back to, um, you know, being an, uh, an office based recruiter and, you know, our policy on work from home and, and managing all of that effectively is is the following. So um, things that we're clear on is if you manage somebody, um, you need to be in the office. Um, and uh, then as a consultant, there's basically a, a gradient that enable you know the more you're billing the more cap the more flexibility you have to work from home and again it's it's structured so you know if you're billing a certain amount per quarter you get access to certain flexibility if that goes up you get access to more flexibility you know and, and also we're a transparent organization if that goes down we're probably gonna have a pretty logical conversation with you around i think it's probably time that you come back but you know that being said sean um everybody wants to be in the office um you know we we again try and have quite a fun environment um, mm. You know, we've got we've got a DJ booth in the office. You know, there's quite a lot of guys here that can DJ pretty well. Um, you know, we, we try and have a fun, engaging place to work. And uh, I think, you know, people enjoy hopefully coming to the office and being at work. I also mm. think, uh, you know, you're sort of a case in point. You know, you've decided to work in an office today, even though you could have worked at home. You know, there yeah. is a sort of mindset focus and then you know the other thing that i think a lot of people realized is you know i do want to be successful i do want to push on and you know if i'm sat in a flat with three of my mates and 
you know, how how much of a good working environment is this? So, you know, from our perspective, um, we are now very much and have been for quite a long period of time now pretty office focused. Right. And you, what, what's the average age in the business? Very young. Uh, so I'm 38. Uh, then there is, uh, then, then there's, there's, there's sort of four leaders who have, you know, who have come through. So, mm. um, Glenn that runs our technology business, Oliver that runs our tax business, um, Hugo that runs our legal U S business, and then Robert who runs our legal, um, EMEA business. Um, you know, those guys are in between frankly, 25 and 27. Um, right. and then, you know, everybody else is, you know, m- most, most other people are probably in between 20 and 24, 25. Um, it's but crazy, also, you yeah. know, we've, we've hired some people recently who, you know, uh, have joined at the entry level, have got no recruitment experience, but have got other experiences. So, you know, actually yeah. there's a group of people who are in April who are a bit more sort of 26, 27, 28. Um, you know, our finance individuals, I think 29, you know, we, we're not, um, you know, we, we're very organically focused, but, um, I'm just thinking that that there's a 10 year gap, gap really. Right. There's a 10 year gap between you and them though, in terms of like just age gap between you and the business. Agreed. The oldest. Yeah, yeah. So like, do you, how do you, do you, like you said before, like they say I'm old and the things they want to do. Yeah. How do you stay, how do you, how do you manage that? Cause you don't need to be everyone's best friend. That's not the point of your job. Yeah. Right? yeah. But you do need yeah. to build relationships and connect. So how, how do you find that you're able to do that? Uh, I don't think that's that hard to be completely honest. You know, I think from a professional perspective, I I can obviously offer a lot of value, um, you know, and, you know, a lot in terms of coaching, mentoring, developing people. um, And hopefully that's super useful for for people. Um, I also think from, you know, outside of work perspective, you know, I'm passionate about making sure that, you know, people don't, you know, burn all of the money that they're making here. So, you know, I'm, I'm also not bad at helping people coach through, you know, why do you buy, why, you know, why do you get on property ladder? Potentially you do it like this, you know, have you thought about investment? Potentially you do it like this, you know, why, okay, you, you bought a property, cool. What about getting a buy to let? Um, mm. And, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about, you know, this, this platform making people who are on it and successful, you know, wealthy individuals. So, um, you know, I guess there's a bit of sort of life coaching, life mentoring there. And then, you know, frankly, like we, we just got back from a ski trip in St. Anton. Um, it was, you know, three day, three nights, four days. Um, it was a reward to say thank you for last year. Um, you know, I, what I wanted to do on that three day ski trip was very, very similar to what the 22 year olds wanted to do on that three day ski trip. Mm. Which was, quite a lot of quite a lot of our prey and, and quite a lot of skiing um mm. so you know i don't think i don't i don't think that's too hard to, to get yeah. all right final question is where where's what's the vision then you've mentioned it briefly about you know you've got a clear structure around where the business is going but can you give us yeah. that roadmap of what's ahead uh yeah so it's pretty ambitious so um this year we will so you know coming out of the blocks we we're just about to close our first quarter we're absolutely on target so um you know we will be 60 people by the end of this year um we'll be um in terms of headcount we'll be 100 uh, the year following we'll be 150 at the end of 24 um we'll be 225 by the end of 2025 um and you know at that point we should be a business that can generate a, a four to five milli bit um, conversion um, and we will you know the, the the agreement is that once we're at a five mil ebit business um, we'll then move it for its first transaction um, um, you know my aim and my commitment is that I'm going to stay with the business long term um, so you know we're going to move the business through multiple um, investment cycles um, and double the business in between each of those investment cycles um, so you know the first one will be at five mil of ebit and 225 of heads um, the second one will be at 10 mil of EBIT and roughly 550 heads. Um, and the third one, if you can do your maths, will be at 20 mil of EBIT and mm-hmm. roughly uh, 1,000 heads. So, you know, we're super clear in terms of our, you know, short, you know, we talk about a one-year sprint, which is what's our 12-month plan. Um, and then we talk about a three-year marathon. Um, and we've got our one-year sprint. We've got our three-year marathon. And we're constantly communicating those. Um, and, you know, they are very, very ambitious tasks. And, you know, we've got... You know, we, we are setting ourselves um, up for a, a big future, um, and you know, it's uh, it's it's not easy. And I think you know that's that's one of the key things that one of my key learns is um, 
it's super easy for people to say they want to be part of such a journey. Um, it is reasonably intense being part of this journey. Um, and, you know, you do need to make sure that you're, you're working with and you're engaging people who actually appreciate that and are, are willing to do the work to, to move the business in that direction. Makes sense. I love it. I mean, it's, it is super ambitious, but I mean, I believe you can do it. I'm so excited by it. What, what's your life like outside of it? You mentioned two children. Um, yeah. How are you able to balance this so you are an effective husband, father, etc., and you know keep yourself mentally sane? Because I yeah. know you must you must be dialed in so much to this to to keep this moving at the pace that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that's a sort of singular answer. You know, I think um, it's diff that getting that right is different for each individual, right? Like. Mm. Um, where does that start? I'm super fortunate. I, uh, I've got an amazing wife. She um, is super committed to what I'm doing. Um, we've been, you know, very, very sad, but I met her. She was in the same graduate intake at Hydrogen that I was at. So, you know, she's seen me through my whole working career. Um, she knows, you know, the good and the bad of uh, me at work. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got a great work ethic. I, you know, I work eight to eight every single day, Monday to Thursday, and then I leave at five on a Friday. Um, you know, I've got a really supportive wife. What does that mean in reality? It means I don't see a lot of my kids, frankly, during the week, and I'm mm. okay with that. And, you know, my wife has got, a, you know, she's fantastic at supporting that. Um, I don't do a lot of work at the weekend, frankly. I'll probably do a bit of work on a Sunday just to basically clear up anything that happened in the last mm. week and make sure I'm prepped for the following week. But, you know, my aim is that Saturday and Sunday is my time with my kids. Um, and, you know, I really, I really do invest into that, you know. I'm, uh, you know, I do loads with them. You know, my eldest is quite into hockey. I'm a coach at the hockey club um, that happens every single Sunday. So, you know, I try and get that balance. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's different for each individual. You know, it's, it's a different, you know, for me, where there's a supportive supportive wife, that makes it a lot easier um, to, to be able to sort of double down and commit to work. Do you find your structure in work is a similar? Do you, are you a similar kind of guy outside of work, like in, with the family? Are you are you organised? Uh, uh, not so much. No, I would actually say my structure in work is probably not more my structure is at home. Um, yeah. You know, I'm a pretty. You know, I'm I'm very very structured. I work really hard, but I'm a pretty chilled individual as well. You know, hopefully mm. reasonably reasonably level headed. Um, so, you know, that that's sort of what works for me. You know, I know you've just joined Virgin, you know, I, you know, I'm just, I sort of go through peaks and troughs of, of fitness. Um, you know, I'm just sort of getting back into that in a meaningful way. And, you know, actually, I think that's working quite well, just working throughout my week. You know, I'm saying, you know, I am going to the gym today at 12 o'clock and from 12 till quarter to one, I will be in a class and then I'll be back yeah. at my desk at quarter past one. And, you know, um, everybody else in the company is more than welcome to do that. And, you know, I'm going to do that too. So I think, you know, it's also, uh, you know, sort of just blocking out a bit of time for a bit of fitness is also, yeah, super, super uh, healthy. It's important. I mean, I, today I did my 77th run of 2022, which is pretty much every day. More than me. Every day apart from one week, I got I twisted my ankle. So, I, you know, I've moved in with my partner's kids and I took them trampolining on a Sunday, all excited. I used to be a trampoline yeah. coach when I was a PT. Okay. So I thought, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good at this. And uh, I'm on this little, I mean, this little, there's like this whole floor of trampolines, these little squares. Yeah. And in between, yeah. in between them is like padding you can walk on. I'm in the air. This kid comes running across. So I, I kind of move my body to the side and I land on what I think is like padding. Rock yeah. solid. Bang. My yeah. ankle just instantly swells. It's like the trampoline off. park. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it was yeah, yeah, parkour yeah. and trampolining. I mean, I was yeah. properly getting into it, trying to be like the cool stepdad, but it didn't yeah. work out. I was like a swollen ankle. But do you know what? Did they have a wall on the walls as well so you can rebound off the walls? Uh, yeah, on one side they had that, and yeah. on the other side there's this like all these panel of lights, so like almost like a do you know yeah, the games yeah. they used to do in gladiators and so you jump up and smack the lights and stuff. It was cool, but it's weird. Like that one week I had off injured, I couldn't walk, I couldn't run. I was just walking around and taking the dogs out. But it properly, what I realized, it really did affect my mood. Like more than I really yeah. like running now has become such a mood changer for me. Um, and like I'll run in the morning and. By the time I get back, 
so I'm coming into the house about 7.15 when the kids have just got up, Lauren's just got up, um, yeah. breakfast time's a bit manic. And, but I'm so much calmer if I come back from the run. Whereas if I've just yeah. woken up and I'm having a coffee and I'm like, and then there's this noise level. Because a year ago, I lived on, well, less than a year ago, I lived on my own with my dog in Manchester in this flat. Now yeah. I've got two dogs, two kids, and it's like a completely new world for me. Yeah. But my running is a is keeping me calm. It's giving me that yeah. like, level of, you know, I'm burning. I've already bounced around the streets. So when I get in and there's noise, I'm like, I'm open to it. Whereas, if, yeah, yeah, I'm learning, you know, my life has transformed so dramatically. In my quite business, a short period of time. Yeah, really short. Like my yeah. business is- How old are the children sound, then? So seven and eight. So they're- Okay, uh, okay. so great. So, so, they, so mine are nine and five. So yeah, quite yeah. similar. Yeah. Quite similar. Boy and a girl, like, and they're, they're the sweetest kids, but they can fight- from nowhere like the, last week yeah. you know i'm just about to do my academy at 4 p.m and the door go, this is why i took this office right so i'm in the afternoon i'm about to take the academy on at 4 p.m it's five to four i hear the door go so i know he's nip down say hello and the boys kick the girl in the face her nose is bleeding i mean bleeding Love and it. yeah lauren's going crazy and the noise like it was like someone had been murdered <laughs> and i'm like and then and then the dogs go nuts and then i'm like <laughs> Can everyone be quiet? Because I'm about to present yeah. to 55 people or 100 people. Um, so I was like, yeah, this, this ain't going to work anymore. So my, work my from plan home now is uh, not an option. Yeah. It's a morning thing. So in the mornings, I work from home. I go to the, to my routine now is run, get back, yeah. say, have breakfast, go and work in my home office. Today I'm not, but it's a, I had a 7.30 call and I just thought it's not going to work. Um, 12 o'clock, I go to the gym or I walk the dogs or I do some other exercise. And then I, I make my way to my office, which is 20 minute walk for about one eat and then two till six I'm on calls and then six till seven, eight, I'm, you know, finishing off and I'm back about seven thirty. So that's, that's yeah, my routine. Right. And then on a Friday, uh, Friday, I, I usually work till about lunch and then I'll be honest, I don't do a lot on a Friday afternoon anymore. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, I love that time. Um, yeah. Ed, Ed, I could talk about this for all day with you. Like you've literally, it's been one of the most, I'm, I'm not just saying it, it's been one of the most, interesting episodes i've ever recorded so you you've got a level of clarity about the way you you're you're building this i think it comes from the second owner position you're in i think it's i think it'd be very hard for you to launch a business with the amount of foresight that you've got in your yeah. first entity so there's a lot of people listening who are doing it for the first time that hopefully yeah we'll learn a lot from this and we'll pick up a lot. Um, if anyone did want to reach out and just pick your brains on things, are you open to other yeah, owners yeah, just more checking than in? To. Yeah, yeah, more than happy to do that. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, the only other thing on. that I'd say is, you know, I think if people are in recruitment businesses and, you know, they're thinking about whether to do it or not, I just, you know, I, I would, you know, you've interviewed some of them, but I think there's a lot of people who have made over the lifetime of their career a lot more money being successful individuals in companies than individuals who, um, you know, leave and try and build entities. I think I think the task ahead of building an entity is, um, you know, it's got a lot of potholes in it and it costs a hell of a lot of money. There you go. It must be 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, I think you bang on. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, I earned more money in my third year in recruitment than I've still ever earned in a year, like personal income. Um, so it, it depends on that. But um, Ed, we're, I'm going to get you back on in a, in a year's time. We're going to check in in a year's time and see how you're getting on. Um, we'll make sure we've hit our numbers. Oh, you will. We well, will do, mate. Thank you so much for today. I really, really appreciate cool. it. Cool. Thanks a lot, Sean. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode was brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2000 recruiters right now both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level, individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn and would love to talk to you. Tune in again next week. That's live on LinkedIn. I'll see you soon. <laughs>